Blog Talk Radio. Your holy book inspired, hate the sparing promise. Your God does love you, I hope you make him wear a condom. People think with prayer they're safe in the streets. Frederick Douglass didn't become free till he prayed with his feet. You can tell the hell in God are man made. They both want to question authority and demand slaves. And any incarnation of slavery is not good. So from here we can deduce I call syndrome is not good. But it gets deeper than this, especially when people get pissed. When you point out their deity's nature and even intent. But I'll never worship anything with evil in it, especially something who allows evil to even exist. I don't give a shit if he created me. I don't give him the right to commit genocide with pride and act crazily. His abuse and neglect and claim is crooked his. If this was Cali, DCFS would have came and took his kids. Belief is so important that if you don't, you go to hell. Without the type of proof you need in court to avoid a jail. Give me the gas can and send me. I don't need the draw all because I can't fathom how your God does. I need to call my shoes, but this looks like an... Hello and welcome to LogiCast with your hosts, Jared Smith and Darby Macy. LogiCast is a weekly call-in radio show. We choose one topic per week. It pertains to politics, science, skepticism, religion, philosophy, history, etc. Our call-in number is 347-215-8862. Real quick, want to give a shout-out to our promoters on Facebook and Twitter, Public and God, Atheism Resource. Um, so this week, we're going to be interviewing Peter Boghossian, author of A Manual for Creating Atheists, who has taken time out of his um, busy schedule during the summer to, uh, you know, to do this interview. So um, real quick, uh, just because it's been all over um, Facebook, Twitter, and pretty much all over the news regarding Robin Williams' death, um, I don't really have a lot to say about the topic. I discuss it on my Facebook page and... um, you know, the only thing that I would say is is that um, if you or someone you know is feeling suicidal, um, it's not a catch-all fix, but um, at least try and find yourself some help. And there are a lot of resources out there dedicated to that. So, um, getting right to it, Peter, can you can you hear me? Uh, I can indeed. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, sure thing. We're we're very excited, and very happy that that you could come and and uh, you know and join us. Oh, well, thank you. Um, appreciate that. So Darby has a bunch of questions she's going to ask, and then sure. I'm going to kind of follow up with a couple things. So sure, sure. Darby, go for it. Hi. And uh, okay. did hi Darby. Did you guys read the book? Yes. Awesome. Yes. That makes this so much more fun and engaging and better. Thank you. Sure. Um, Do people actually so, yeah. interview you that haven't read the book, by the way? I just wanted to ask that real quick. Yeah, more more often than not, actually. Um, I mean, at least initially it used to happen quite frequently, much to my astonishment, but people would interview me and yeah. read the book. <laughs> and I don't really know. So I would say something and they'd say, like, what do you mean? And I guess, All right. you, you know, what do you mean, what do I mean? I, I spent 50 pages on that. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it helps the conversation if just two people on the, two folks are on the same page. So thank you. Did you like the book? I'm not fishing. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. I really enjoyed the book. I've actually read it twice, so. Oh, wow. I'm a big fan. You really have read the book. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, so I like the book. Me, anything you want. Um, oh, cool. I, well, thanks. Yeah, no, I, I actually I have been meaning to read the book for about a month now, and um, when Darby told me that she had this idea that uh, you know she wanted to ask you if you would like to be interviewed by us, I was sort of put into panic mode um, because I actually I actually finished the book about uh, forty five minutes ago, so it's still fresh in my head. <laughs> So, yeah, wow, that's um, yeah, I that's great. Yeah, I, I blasted through it over about the past. About the past three days, so oh, you know. Fantastic. Well, I'm. I'm it was great. Uh, it was a great. Shoot movie. away! Absolutely, shoot away! Oh. Go for it. 
Okay, cool. Um, I'd like to, um, in case people are listening who haven't read it, um, it's called A Manual for Creating Atheists. And what I really like um, about what you said regarding the title is that you would have rather named it Street Epistemology, but you're, um, I'm sure your publisher and agent didn't think that would <laughs> fly off the shelves. But that's really what is so interesting about it, because there are plenty of books on, um, I mean, there are a lot of great books on atheism and on critical thinking, but uh, the focus on epistemology is what I found so interesting. So um, for anyone listening, epistemology in a very simple way just means the, how you know what you know or the study of knowledge. Um, and you uh, advocate going for um, explaining to people or trying to talk people out of uh, faith because it's an unreliable epistemology. And um, I really kind of like that idea because, uh, you know, what you say in there about, you know, when you attack God or religion to somebody, what, what you're really attacking is their, you know, their youth group or their pastor that they love or, or their, you know, the Christmas mass that they've enjoyed with their family. And um, I just, I don't know, I, I find that a way better way to sort of go about it. Do, do you want to say something about that? Because I really, I find that sort of useful. No, I think you put your finger right on it. Uh, you talk about how people know what they know, and you stick to that. And talking about God just either makes people defensive. While it's fun, it's, it is fun. Um, it, it doesn't <laughs> achieve what you'd like it to achieve, and it makes people better debaters, so it really kind of worsens their uh, – epistemic is a big word for you know how they come to know things. Because then they have – just writing a paper about this now, you know, just right before I um, right before I called you – that people will then come to the conclusion that the beliefs that they hold are more likely to be true when they're better at arguing them. And Michael Sherman talks about that, and, and others have talked about that as well. So you basically undermine the idea, you take a look at faith, and you teach people or help people, depending on the context, to understand that their faith does not do for them what they wanted to do specifically to get them to the truth. Right. Um, and, and while we're on it, you're, you, you start off defining terms that Jared and I do um, admin work on a, a page on Facebook called atheism resource. It's also a critical thinking skepticism page. And um, both of us have learned over the years that it's critically important to define terms at the beginning of yeah. any conversation yeah. because you may be talking about two entirely different things if you don't get specific exactly. about what you're talking about. Exactly. And you have, yeah, you have a couple sort of working definitions of faith um, that you like to use that are, I know um, they've been contentious for a lot of theists who go, that's not what I mean when I say it, you know. Um, and one of them is uh, pretending to know what you don't know, which is probably my favorite one. And then um, I think you bring up John Loftus's, uh, you know, irrational leap over the possibilities, which is another really good one. But um, I also like how you sort of disambiguate faith from hope and trust and remind right. people that it's a good idea to not mix those up in common speech because they don't mean the same thing. Yeah, and I have a prediction. I'm going to make a prediction to you. It's a bold and uh, – seemingly arrogant prediction, but I'm going to make it anyway. I think that you're going to see the rise of trust and the word trust. And I think you're going to see Christians more and more shy away from faith. And I think you're going to see Christians almost ex almost exclusively talk about having confidence in the promise of Jesus. I think they're going to change their language. I think that that's what we haven't gotten into this yet in our discussion, but I think that's one way that the faith virus morphs itself into people's cognitive architecture. I think it's like that's the software. That's the the way that people can maintain the belief when they realize that faith is flimsy and they can't do what they want to do. So they'll switch from the word faith to the word trust, which – if you don't think about this stuff a lot, you say, well, what's, what's the big deal? It's just a word. Well, words, words matter. Words are incredibly yeah. important. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I am a, I'm trained in writing, so I'm <laughs> crucially, it's crucial that people use words the way they mean them, especially when it comes to large issues like this. Um, yeah. And 
sort of sweeping, you know, they, that people use faith as a way of, I mean, I, I've been amazed at the different ways that people have sort of hacked at it. You know, when you, when you say something, you say, well, it's this, well, it's belief without sufficient evidence is what I sometimes say to people. And they get so prickly about that because they want it to be something else or sound a lot different, sort of okay. like they've already arrived right. there and they go backwards to, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I mean, you're, you're 100 percent right. So if they, in effect, I was just uh, having a conversation with a, a Christian about this. So if the idea is that there is evidence for your faith, then I don't understand why I'm not the poster child of fundamentalists, of every, every stripe of Christian, every flavor, every denomination. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's one of the messages that, that I advocate. It's formulating your belief on the basis of evidence. And if there's sufficient right. evidence then you should have me in every single mega church, every small, every church in the country. Sure. Why, why are so many people so upset? And, and I, <laughs> we don't have to talk about, right? I mean, really, we don't have to talk about God or it's not the gospel. We can totally just talk about how it's important and why, it's, how does one go about doing that and why that's important. And if Christians truly, truly believed that, then th- they would be, I should be their poster boy. Yeah. I mean, if if the but, evidence but, is there, and yeah, yeah, but they don't believe it, and that's why they're pretending to know something they don't know. They they know so, there's insufficient uh, evidence to warrant belief, right? They know that they don't have enough evidence, but faith right. is the thing that keeps them believing anyway. And there, we, we don't have to talk about the consequences of this. We we can just keep it to the shift to, to what's occurring now. Why would the message believe on the basis of evidence? be so offensive to people or so demeaning to people or yeah. so why would that rub them the wrong way? And how can they both claim that that's false and simultaneously claim that they they ought to continue to hold these beliefs in spite of the evidence? You, you, can't, right. you just can't have both of those things. You, you can have one of those things, but you can't right. have both of those things. So let me interject here real quick, Peter, because there are a couple of questions I have. I'm going to ask this one just because we're on the subject. Um, in, in your book, and I, I've been doing this for a long time, by the way. I mean, arguing. I, I don't have the philosophical backgrounds um, like you do. A lot of the points in your in your book, I was like, yeah, I already do that. I didn't have a maybe didn't have sort of an explanation for why I did that or what the the actual <laughs> process or procedure was for it. Um, I mean, I come from the IT world, so. Uh, but you you talk about the existence, talk about not arguing against the existence of God, and instead, you yeah. know, focusing on faith. I mean, it's really, really a big a big part of your book. And the only reason why I have a problem with this is is because the majority of people are indoctrinated into the belief in God long before they ever learn what giving justification for a belief is. So if we start from that position and work our way back, you could disengage someone from faith and maybe even in a specific God, but you don't necessarily disengage them from the belief in a higher power. And in fact, a few studies have surfaced recently which show that millennials are actually less likely to be religious, um, but more willing to hold on to belief in a higher power, among other supernatural, superstitious bullshit kind of things. And it it seems like your book takes the position that faith is a primary issue and not the indoctrination that convinces impressionable minds. And instead of using the word faith, these people, uh, the millennials who, you know, believe in this nonsense, at least in my experience, will substitute it with the word supernatural because the former has been kind of co-opted by religion and the latter has been co-opted by woo doctors like Chopra. Um, I, I think making use of the word faith specifically might undermine an otherwise good argument. I mean, what, what is your yeah, opinion I mean, on I that? Yeah, I mean, think that's a, I think that's legitimate. And somebody said to me that none of the interventions in the book use the word faith. And, I, I, again, I, I haven't read that. But it, if that's true, that's quite interesting. You don't need to – you can do this without ever having – in fact, you don't even have to talk, do the techniques in the book and the epistemological interventions. You don't even have to talk about religion or God or faith or what have you. It's just you talk about how people know things. And that switch, I think, is really important. So let's say that somebody makes that turn in their thinking from 
God exists, the supernatural realm exists, all you need to do at that juncture is just hit them with this thing called the defeasibility test. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. It's basically, well, what would it take for you to change your mind about that? And if they say, if the response to that is it would take nothing to change my mind about that, then the follow-up to that is, well, then you don't really believe, you don't really believe that argument in, in the, to begin with. Sorry, I have to leave the room. Sorry, sorry about the noise. So let me give you an example. So someone says, well, I think that there's a supernatural realm. And you say, well, what do you mean by the supernatural realm? And you say, well, you know, it's just something out there that makes the tangible impressions on this domain in which we live now, but you can't really see it, hear it, taste it, or smell it, but there's just got to be something greater. And then you say, well, what would it take for you to change that belief? And again, these conversations are dynamic. You have no idea what anybody's going to say. You know, they they could say nothing. They could say one piece of evidence like Bill Nye. They could say anything. And so if they say if the response to that is nothing, then they don't really believe on the basis of any argument they just gave. Right. If the response right. that is, if they give you a specific response, then you, you can say that's fantastic, and then you see if you can meet that the criteria which set out. And if they say I don't know, that's considerably more difficult because then you'd have to tease that out. So it right. doesn't really matter. So I, that, that's just a ling- linguistic placeholder, right? Supernatural. You, you could just plug in anything you want to it. leprechauns, werewolves. You know, you could just plug in stuff in the supernatural realm, Bigfoot. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Did we lose you? Here? Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I. No, no. I, I thought he was going to continue. By the way, there's sort of a little bit of a oh, delay. Yeah. So, I, uh, and and I recognize that. Um. By the way, with everything that you said, I I pretty much agree. I I take the same approach with regard to the question I always ask people before I get into an, an argument with them regarding regarding their beliefs. Is 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 there anything that I can say to you that would convince you that you could be wrong not that you are wrong but that you could be wrong and yeah, that's right and right exactly so go this is really important. and and if they say no what do you say if well in my experience if they say no then the conversation's kind of um kind of over and the reason oh, why no, is, no, is that's because when the conversation begins that <laughs> those are excellent conversations Cool. I want to hear this. Those, yeah, <laughs> I, so, I, I do too. Go ahead. Okay. So, so you, you're having a conversation with someone. You say, well, is there – you just started and, – and by the way, just parenthetically, that's very wise of you to do that because it saves you time like to begin with rather than giving them pieces of evidence and saying, no, that doesn't work, no, that doesn't work. You just cut to the chase right away, and that way you can perform more interventions in, in less time. So um, – so if you say, well, is there anything I can say to you to change your mind, and they say no, there are multiple responses to that. One could be, don't you find that disturbing? I mean, doesn't that, doesn't that upset you or ought not that to upset you? And in that case, I would use the word you because you need in that rare, in some rare cases, you do need to make it personal, and that's one of them. And then you so can what do you say it, to them if it, they so, – and I'll so, play devil's advocate here. If, if, they, yeah. if they say – um, you know, if you let's, let's say you ask the question, um, yeah. you know, shouldn't it bother you that nothing can change your mind? And they say, well, no. Where do you go okay, from there? So in what? Okay, so well, anyway, I'll just throw one thing on top of my head right now. Uh, in what other domain is that the case? Is that the case in biology? Is that the case in, I don't know, playing a musical instrument? Is that the case in jiu-jitsu? Is that the case in writing? That is, the, that is not the case in anything else in your life. If, if a biologist, if, you know, if you're studying, a, I don't know where I'm getting biology, but you could substitute a chemistry, it doesn't make a difference. So, you know, hey, this is, this is my hypothesis. I wrote about this in the book for the influenza virus. And you say, well, I'm not going to believe that. I'm, I'm just going to continue to believe anyway. You don't. Nobody does that in any other aspect of their life. Why should right. this be any different? So, did you see how I also ended with a question? So, why should this be any different? Then puts the onus on them to explain to you why it's different. So, as long as they answer the questions, as long as there's a dialogue, there's a possibility that you can engender belief revision. Because the problem the person has is that. It's not a problem of critical thinking, almost, I shouldn't say that universally, but it's almost never a problem of critical thinking or 
uh, critical rationality, but it's a problem. The problem is that they don't value the right things. They don't value the process of belief revision. So if they don't value the process of re- belief revision, then your job at that critical moment in the beginning of the conversation when they say no is to help them, is to guide them and to facilitate with them in that dialectical exchange, that conversation that you're having. You have to help them to value the right things. And in that case, the right value is belief revision. So that's your job. Your job is to pave the way. Your job is to set the groundwork at that crucial state. Not to talk about God, not even talk about faith, but just to talk about right. a, pre, a fundamental value that will would then subsequently engender those you know, additional dispositions and, and whatever it will take to help them out of these delusions they have. Right. That actually makes sense. The, I, I the like that. I like that response. I, I'm sorry, Darby. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, no. Um, I was just going to say, uh, I think... No, go ahead and say what you're going to say because I'm I'm going to float off a little bit here. Go ahead. Yeah, I I mean I understand that. There's there's also a part in your book, and one of the parts that I like, by the way, because one of the I actually besides the whole don't be a dick thing, you know, just because you're talking to someone <laughs> with different views, we both really like that. But besides that, there was a there was a part in your book where you discuss uh, conversations about evidence. And this is a really important thing because when you have two people who do not agree on what evidence is, but both of them are still calling it evidence, it's very difficult, at least in my experience, to have a decent conversation because if you can never begin to agree on this point, in fact, you even say don't even really argue the evidence necessarily because people are going to fit it to their liking, Um, paraphrasing, obviously. Yeah, so people don't, many people who are trapped in these delusions, they don't formulate their beliefs on the basis of evidence. If they did, they wouldn't be trapped in delusions, right? So there's no amount of evidence, there's no data point, there's nothing that you can give somebody that they'll say, oh, you know, I I didn't have that data point, now I have it, now I'm cool, and I realize that I've been delusional for the last 15 years. Uh, (laughs) No, it doesn't, it, 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 it just doesn't work like that. And the problem is, I think that's a sticking point in the book for people who are thoughtful, educated, particularly educated and intelligent, is they think, well, gee, I just, I formulate my beliefs this way. And they extrapolate from that and they just assume that other people formulate their beliefs that way. And they say, well, if I just give these people the right data points, everything will be cool. You know, they'll revise their beliefs. That's just not true. I mean, it's just, it's patently, patently false. Well, yeah, and you say in there that you have to meet people where they are, and I I agree. It's it's sort of an empathetic failure to be assuming that everybody comes to conclusions the same way you do and that they think about things the same way you do, and that's where these conversations get difficult. And and yeah. Yeah. sort of what sure. I was going to say about how – one of the reasons I like your approach is um, I think um, among the admins on our on our page, I'm sort of – this is funny because in my life I'm not, but I'm, I'm a little bit of the Pollyanna. And the reason that that is is that I'm hoping to engage people and get them to actually talk to me. And when you start insulting them, you've lost them. And I'm not saying that there's no place for, you know, satire, or ridicule, or any of that stuff. But the reason I like this approach is because I'm hoping to talk to people and not change their mind so at the end of the conversation they'll go, oh, you're absolutely right. This whole thing is absurd. But but to have a moment where they think about it for a minute, especially if they haven't thought about it before. Your your uh, doxastic openness, that word is really difficult right. to say. But, um, the, and, and, of course, there's a, you kind of have to want to do this in order to approach it this way. And, and there are a lot of people in the sort of atheist and skeptic circles that, you know, go straight for it. This is incredibly stupid. And it's like, well, that serves a purpose, but the purpose is not going to be, are you going to try to reach this person and have a conversation with them? Because at that well, how, point, how sad for those people, done. right? I mean, how, how sad yeah. for the people who get off on humiliating other people? Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not a fan, but I also think, you know, you, you're serving and expect people to keep talking to you, but they're not going to. And if you don't want them to, that's cool. I mean, that is, there's a, yeah. there's a point. You have to ask you, yourself you know. what your goal is. If your goal is to yeah. be a jerk, well, then that's a great way to achieve it. If your goal yeah. is to help somebody 
is to have a genuine concern with, for the person with whom you're speaking and to help them out of a, a form of life in which they're trapped, then that's just simply not the way to do it. Now, I'm not, again, I think you're right when you mention context. I'm not saying that Ricky Gervais or Bill Maher, these guys, uh, that, that in that context of, you know, TV audiences and YouTube videos and that, I think that definitely has a role, but I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one conversations and interactions that you have with people. And I, I mean, I think that's sort of a crit critical um, distinction to make because I have people that jump on threads when I'm on them and say, I don't know why you're bothering. You know, these people can't be reasoned with or whatever. And I understand the frustration that comes from people but that's who just feel not like. True. No, that's it's not, not true at all. They, and I, I, I say these people, you're I mean, surrounded right, right. right now I by atheists in the community. It's empirically yeah. false. People have talked out of yeah. faith traditions all the time. Yes, they are. And and most people on our page used to be believers. Some of them were fervent believers. And so well, and, and often not only are they, they talked out of one yeah. belief system, they're talked into another belief system that might even be contradictory to their former belief system. So I mean, you know, people's minds are most certainly malleable. I, that that was in your book actually, I think. I think I ripped that directly from from your book. <laughs> yes. It's a beautiful point, by the way. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so I, I, and part of that, I think what, one of the one of the things I really enjoyed in there is uh, when you were transcribing some of the interactions you had with people, and and you can I can hear them getting defensive, and and all of us run into this, and I really try to diffuse that as best I can, but I think employing the Socratic method is so useful there, and I don't think I've done that enough, and I'm I have sort of tried to incorporate that because you know I remember one guy said to you I think um, what are you trying to say. And you said to him, I'm actually not saying anything. And you weren't. It wasn't, a, it wasn't some sort of, you know, semantic trick. You really weren't. Right. You were just asking him questions. And, and it, I can see, um, you know, I can hear people, they step back a little bit from this defensive posture and actually answer right. a question or actually listen if you are not saying, well, this and this and this is wrong. Right. And that's what I think. And then pause, you know. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and the best way to facilitate that, and by that I mean, you pull the line from the book to not invoke someone's defensive posture is to see that in yourself. You know, you have to model the behavior that you want to emulate. So if you don't, if you want to be kind and compassionate and you, you want to engender those dispositions in people, belief revision, then that's what you have to do. And so being frustrated, being angry, all of those things are counterproductive. They, they don't get you towards the goal of really uh, genuinely helping people. Right. Look, no, I mean, these, these, so. Part of the problem is that these people, people of faith, have been raised in these communities, like you said, their whole lives. They're terrified. They're scared. Uh, they're not lonely because they have their friends who share in their delusions with them. Right. But they really are trapped into a form of life. And you can, can not you, but one can continue to be a jerk and attempt to humiliate them or ridicule them for what they believe, or you can try to have a genuine conversation with someone and be willing to acknowledge if somebody knows something you don't know, that you don't know what it is. You know, because people, I talk yeah. to people all the time, I have, I, they have more knowledge than I do. I mean, like, you know, that's not artificial humility. That's just the truth. No, so I, you, I yeah. agree. It happens to me all the time, too. And and the, the assumption that I understand, like I said, from, from especially people who live in very religious communities, and they feel like they're the only atheists there, and they kind of feel like they're always throwing, you know, a defensive forearm out to what seems like. And so I understand it's easy to sort of jump and go, oh, you know, I'm not, I don't want to deal with that, or You're, this is incredibly stupid or whatever. But, but the, you know, I, when people say, and unfortunately they do, um, oh, this is, you know, all believers are A or B, or if you believe this, you're stupid, which I find that I that really actually um, pushes one of my very large buttons because I just can't stand it when people say that. It's not true. Um, and it's, when they say it's what? When they say what exactly? Well, um, uh, when they talk, say, oh, believers are stupid. If you believe this, you're stupid. No. But that's just, just that's, again, that's, wrong. An, that, that's an empirical claim. It's just wrong. false. Yeah. yeah. I mean, very, very smart people, Francis. Cause. I mean, very, very smart people historically and smart people. Uh, so, so it has nothing to do with intelligence. I deconstruct that notion in the book. And, and I yeah. think no, not at all. If, I may, if I may toss a hammer at the atheist community as if I need more enemies right now. No, I think that <laughs> that kind of smugness or that kind of, uh, if you'll excuse the vulgarity, holier-than-thou attitude, I, yes. I think that that... that being being an atheist does not mean you're more intelligent than anybody else. If, oh, no. if I don't, not I don't at all. believe that, not that at Thor, all. 
I don't believe that, that Thor was an actual god. That doesn't make me more intelligent than anybody else. That just means I don't I didn't fall for that. I wasn't raised in that community and threatened with hellfire. So right. I think that people need to get over this smug sense of self importance they have because they they're not they've been fortunate for whatever reasons in their life not to be susceptible to some pretty harmful and hurtful delusions. Yeah. Or they've somehow managed to sort of, you know, get get themselves out or someone has helped them out, that doesn't mean that someone that isn't out is inferior to them in any way. And yeah, Right, and I think it's the, hypothetical yeah. that people would assert that, by the way, and the reason why is, is because, again, many people are indoctrinated with this belief from birth. I mean, some people exactly. actively fear for their lives, you know, right. being involved exactly. in, in certain terrified. sects of They're religion. Terrified. So, you know, recognizing that, that fear or that harm, um, you know, on one – one day or over the course of many months doesn't mean that the 15, 16, 20, 30 years that they spent in it meant that they were stupid well, throughout all of that time. I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to throw, it, yeah, go ahead. There's no, a little well, delay I, was say phone, was I, that I I think that it, no, it's okay. Uh, again, there's a delay, so I mean, we fully understand that. Um, you know, I think that it actually undermines a lot of the struggles that some people go through when they try to get out of these really difficult situations. Um, you know, and and I I think that it I think it it does a horrible disservice to atheists when they say, well, only stupid people believe in this. Um, yeah, when I there's think, evidence to the I, contrary. I think I think that's right. I'll throw out I'll throw a little curveball at you, if I may. I I do a lot of jujitsu, and a buddy of mine, it's like a combat wrestling, and a buddy of mine said it's it's uh, uh, Matt Thornton. He said. People roll the way that they roll. They wrestle the way their personalities are. So that to me many years ago, and I found nothing to be be more true than that. Yeah. It's just who, yeah. who? Yeah, it's fascinating. Who they are as people comes out. Their personalities come out when they engage. I think that's the same thing when people engage theists. Their personalities come out. I, I have often found when I'm speaking with theists. Not rank and file believers who tend to be much more sincere and authentic than apologists who tend to be hell bent. Again, if you'll excuse that vulgarity, on uh, winning and defeating, and they're always angry. There's anger in their voices. They're checked. Yeah, they have to hold this position. I think that that those sorts of engagements tell we tell us who we are as people. I mean, what really, what kind of person do you want to be? Do you want to be the person who's just a jerk? If someone's in the other room and they're talking about you, it's much better that they say that you're a kind person than they say that you're a smart person. And so what kind of person I agree. do you want to be? Yeah, do you want to be the person who goes around and mocks and ridicules and and uh, dumps on theists? No, I mean, that tells you more about you than it does about them. And you need if, if you're yeah. that type of person and you're listening to this, you just need to grow up. You need to get some maturity and you need to grow up. Yeah, and I this is probably a good place to um, talk about because oh, Liz comes up all the time and, and you bring it up as well. And I've had this conversation with people many times. Um, somebody will post something on our site and the, the comment threads will start and pe- people show up really angry and say, this is a personal attack. And it's some satirization of the flood story or whatever. It's personal yeah. In no way at all. And right. I can't count the number of times I've had to say to people, no one is being attacked. This is a an idea. Beliefs and ideas exactly. are subject to scrutiny, and, right. ridicule, and, and, whatever, excellent. including you mine. Again, read the book. Excellent. In the book, yes, you are <laughs> absolutely correct. And the way to discern that, the, the litmus test for that is, is it an immutable characteristic? So many theists think right. that their their faith is part of their identity. Now, just we can bracket that and come back to it, but the, the litmus test for whether or not one should, should be able to level criticism or something is, is it an immutable characteristic of a person or is it an idea? Right. All ideas ought to be subject to criticism. If it is a, in a, if it is a characteristic that can't be changed, you know, a, a wide nose or curly hair or, you know, light skin or eye color, then that that's off the table. That ought not to be criticized. And so just with that simple – now, you, people can disagree with that, but then we can have a substantive discussion about, you know, what, what, what that means and the limits of that, et cetera. But, again, you need to look at their reaction because 
either because they don't believe it themselves and it's just a defensive reaction or because they're just scared. You know, they're scared. They, they right. don't, right? And so often many of the people who exhibit that reaction, in a sense they have to because that reaction is the difference between the belief they have and the evidence they hold for the belief. In right. other words, that's, that's what faith is. It picks up that slack right in that little space right there. So if they're assigning a confidence value to a belief, then it's higher than, it's, than, than that which is warranted by the evidence. And someone calls them out on it or you know, it, it, they have to take some other posture. They have to be offended. They have to be outraged. They have to walk away. But if they assign beliefs in direct proportion to the evidence they have for those beliefs, they don't need to be any of those things. They just need to look at the evidence. Right, and then there's no discomfort because there's no, you know, sort of clang of cognitive dissonance where they're going, oh, that doesn't make sense, or, you know, I'm, you know, because then the defensive upset thing comes in and whatever. And usually when I say to people, because I've, I've, it was, it was great to read that because I, I so believe that, and I've been kind of hacking at it. I usually say, um, you know, people, um, I don't attack people. We don't attack right. people. Um, and you say humans deserve dignity. I've, I've said the same thing because I usually say respect. I, you know, I respect human beings. Um, and I often say that to really angry, ranting theists that I absolutely respect their right to believe whatever they want as long as it doesn't hurt other people. And that's calmed down a huge number of people right there because their fear that I'm trying to, to like, make their religion illegal goes away, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that seems to be really common. But, But the – you're right that people don't seem to understand that a belief is they are not their belief. That is not them. Because, right. you know, I, there's so many people who think, oh, no, that is just me, and I, what would I do without it? And then you can hear the fear starting to leak in there. And this is the part that really makes me, because you think about this fear being instilled into little people and telling them, if you don't believe this, you're going to mm. burn for hell and eternity. Good night, you know, and <laughs> so you can hardly mm. blame them for having that fear. I mean, right. you know, the Pascal's wager comes in to their head, and they right. think, oh, my gosh, what if I'm – I can't even think so, about this because what if I'm wrong, you know? So you're right. So right, and, and I kind of want to jump in here on the topic of indoctrination, yes, right. by the way, um, in, in the sense that most children at very young ages – I mean, it takes a while before you get to the point of, um, you know, telling kids that if you don't believe this, that, you know, that this visceral sort of hell exists. Um, you know, normally it starts off with the kind of assertion. And by the way, religions, specifically Christianity and Islam, apparently is doing a pretty good job of it too. Um, has kind of uh, solidified the actual process of making sure that children start from the position of God exists to, you know, the to then eventually moving on to. Now there's a fear that you will have instilled in your heart if you don't believe in God. Um, exactly. And then it just kind of ex expounds from there. So, and that's you know, all the I, I mean, I just I kind of wanted to point that blame. out. Yeah, that's all the more reason to eliminate blame and to be kind to people who have grown up with the fear of, of uh, being tortured for eternity. I mean, it's a horrible thing yeah. to inflict on people. I mean, yeah. I think we, we all agree in this conversation that we need to be m more civil and we need to treat people with kindness and respect, even though we don't, we don't respect their ideas and we can be blunt and forthright about what those ideas are. But the question then is, what's the best way to engage those ideas? And when I wrote a manual for creating atheists, that's what I put in. Like, what, how, what are the techniques and tools and tips and strategies that people can use to literally talk people out of faith and superstition and into reason. And by the way, that's my current project. I'm writing an app, and the app is, I'm telling you, it is epic. Nobody has ever done anything like this. There are these unbelievably massive dialogue trees that guide people through right and wrong answers when the theist says something, why they're right and wrong, how to dovetail them back. It's a... Uh, it's set up like the jujitsu belt system. So there's white, blue, purple, brown, and black. And <laughs> each, cool. each, yeah, each level are, are increasing. Each uh, has has increasingly difficult dialogue trees and content with hyper specific arguments at brown belt and uh, more general 
arguments towards white belt, and there's like video clips in it where people identify fallacies about God. I mean, it's just, this thing is just mind-blowingly epic. I have a whole team working on it. But anyway, though that that is going to help people um, so they can they can practice on the app, if you will. So some people are very shy. Yeah. So now that we uh, now that we all agree upon that we need to tr- to be more civil in our discourse, the next question is: We have the tools from the book, the Manual for Creating Atheists. We got that. We know this. She says this. We have examples of conversations. Now let's bump that up another notch. Yeah, I mean it'd be great to have sort of an on the run thing on your phone that you can go. Hmm, what do I do about that? And, um, yeah, so you it's, see your it's game not you're working to, on too. Yeah, I do. I do. I'll finish that thought. It's not enough that we oh, cool. uh, that we sit around and piss and moan about it. The, the next thing we need to do is to take action on it. And so, yeah. that's my invitation to, to folks: is don't just read the book. Uh, of course, if you, if you interview me, please do read the book. But don't just read the <laughs> book. Actually, do something about it. Uh, and and finally, I'll say. We need one more artist. So if you're an artist and you'd like to volunteer, it's strictly volunteer for the app, then just send me a tweet or an email, and uh, I'll send you over to our tech guy. So, yeah, we have a game. So a game that's coming out. So, okay, so let's frame this this way. There are certain attitudinal dispositions that are imperative that people hold before they can toss off superstition. And faith. Many people don't hold these attitudinal dispositions, and the consequence of that is they don't want to revise their beliefs. They don't. They think they already have the truth. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, in an academic context, it's difficult. I think you can do that in other contexts, like a game. So we kickstarted a game. It's called Jux, J-U-X. It's on Kickstarter right now. And the basic idea of the game is it's a creative storytelling game that helps develop those dispositions, those attitudes that are essential to develop critical rationality. Oh. So you could do that in, in, a, in a different venue. That, for example, you, you couldn't do that in an academic context, but you can do that in terms of the game. So I'm going to – Dawkins gave me a, uh, the Dawkins Foundation. I have a, a post on their – I have a blog on their site, and I've been meaning to, to write about this, but it's not enough that we write books. We need apps. We, need to, we, just, we don't even need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to pull with the cookies. technology. We need, yeah. Yeah, we need apps. We need characters and shows that have the right attitudes about things. We need strong atheist models, and not just models, on, you know, models in the community like Harris or Richard, but we need models on TV, strong characters. It's very similar to what the... Uh, homosexual community did, and then the LGBT movement, and so right. we, we have to we have to fight the tide of irrationality on a multitude of different levels and with a multitude of different tools. Because if we don't, I agree. the encroachment of reason, right? Yeah. Sorry, the, the I, lag. Yeah, I mean, I agree. The, the I lag agree on too, the phone sure. is a little disconcerting. It's, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was just going to say they're 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 are quite a few people that are just not going to be reached by a book. I mean, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> so if you can give them some way to access this stuff and, and where it feels more comfortable to them, then you're, you know, you're going to be way more effective. And you know, they, they won't be reached and we need to hit them. They need different media. They need music. They need, there's a, I tweeted a song, <coughs> excuse me, that was, really instrumental in a lot of young people uh, abandoning their faith. Uh, I just tweeted a few weeks ago. I can't remember it. But, you know, so it was by hip-hop artists. And so, so we, have, we have these tools, these media that exist at our disposal. We need to make more use of them. You know, Atheist TV, I think, was a good start, but it doesn't go nearly as far enough as what we need. Again, part of that is inserting characters into the broader milieu, the social and right. cultural playing field. And I think if we can do that, and if we can do that in a way that, again, puts values first and, and not whether or not someone is an atheist, that's secondary, but they value the right things. If people value the right things, then they'll come to their own conclusions about God and Jesus, and, but, but particularly about the Quran or what have you, ISIS, but particularly about faith and the role that faith ought to play in one's life. Yes, I agree. I think that um, that's sort of a, a effect of having 
you know, of valuing the right things and of, of being able to engage critical thinking about everything and not have to, you know, well, I'm not going to think about that or I can't really think about that or whatever. And so, um, yeah, I think that, that works. Well, we're on – while we're on this talking about people, or talking about people, talking to people about this, um, I want to, um, for anybody listening, there are a couple things that I'll, a lot of us run into um, frequently in these kind of conversations, and I'm hoping that you might be able to shed some light on the best way to respond. My least favorite, I have to say, is when you're talking to somebody about, oh, well, how do you know that or whatever, and right. you get the I know it in my heart. I Great. just I have I just wrote uh I just wrote about that for like sixteen hours the other day. Um cool. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> so there are many, many, many ways to deal with that. One way is to frame it in terms of other people and other people's religion. And again, it's hard unless people have read the book, but you know, don't don't you think that there how how could we explain the fact that Muslims believe if you're talking with Christian, that Muslims believe this in their heart. Well, I think they're wrong. Okay. But they, they do sincerely believe it, right? So in other words, you, you cast in one of the dialogues I had, <coughs> excuse me, with the young man at the gym, one of the dialogues I had is exactly about that, is that you help people reflect on their own beliefs by or through a discussion of other uh, religious beliefs. And there are lots of things you can do. Have you ever felt really strongly about something and it turned out that your feelings didn't align with reality. Um, right. I tell you, one, yeah. one time that happened to me very intensely. Uh, you know, I thought I went out to dinner with my, my uh, ex-girlfriend. I was totally in love with her and I thought where she was going to ask me, you know, who knows, ask me to marry me or whatever. So, and she broke up with me over dinner. And so I, you know, like my feelings oh. stayed. Did, yeah, I know, I know, right? Uh, so my feelings yeah. stayed didn't align with the reality of her feeling state, but yet it, I was just a total bombshell for me. So maybe helping people to, to understand or relate to the fact that they had those sorts of experiences, right? And how do they know that this experience is different? So Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. That's actually, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've tried to sort of, um, I've said that. I've, I've heard people say, well, you know, they may feel this, but there are many paths to the, you know, they kind of get this idea that, like, oh, everybody's really having the same feelings about the same guy. Okay. Just, 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 to inter, just to interject real quick, <laughs> by the way, uh, real quick, um, part of that is actually wrapped in apologetics, and Peter, I'm sure you know this, that, you know, the idea that our specific sect, our specific denomination, our specific belief system has the right one, specifically in, and especially inside of Christianity. I mean, it's you know, it's completely ridiculous how, you know, how ingrained that kind of is into their, you know, sort of thought process that there'll be this minority who actually has the right, you know, the right answer. So, of course, these other people are wrong because they're the ones who are most likely to follow false gods, not me. Right. Yeah, that's that's exactly correct. And so in those senses... I mean, those, to me, are always really interesting conversations, and they really don't take that long to dismantle. It depends on somebody's degree of closure and if, how much apologetics training they've had, and if they really do have a sincere truth, a sincere wish to find out what's true, which almost invariably, you know, that's the famous Bertrand Russell quotation, it's not to, there's a difference between the wish to find out and the, and the will to, I'm drawing a blank here. The, the will to find out versus the wish to. My buddy has a tattoo in his arm. Um, wish to. Know, I can't remember what's going on. But yeah, so, so those, all, all of those, all of those conversations. Again, the, 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 you know, when I wrote a manual for creating atheists, it wasn't like I pulled it out of an ether. I found out what worked, and and I've been doing this stuff for over 25 years, and I found out what worked, and I. I put those conversations in, you know, frankly, you guys read the book, I put even the conversations in which I fail, and I fail a lot. I fail all the time. But it's the whole Steve Jobs, if you want to succeed, you have to double your failure rate. You just have to try. You know, I mean, you have to – I mean, it can be born out of a bunch of things, a combination of the concern for humanity. I don't know if you guys have kids, but if you have kids, the desire to make the world better and to help people and uh, make the world a little better when you when you leave it. And w one of the ways that – different people can make a different contribute, uh, contribute to that in different ways. So I'm not saying that, look, I really sincerely hope that somebody comes out in a year or two years 
and it totally rewrites my whole book. They improve the techniques. They hone them down. Great. Nothing, truly nothing would make me happier. We have a problem, and the problem is that people have beliefs that are harmful to not only other people, but harmful to themselves, and they've hurt a lot of people. And rather than everybody sitting around talking about how much they can't stand it, I think it's time that we do something about it. And there are many ways to do something. The Freedom from Religion Foundation does something about it. Uh, yeah. Four horsemen have done something. I'm offering a solution. It's not the solution to this problem. Uh, I'm offering a solution to this problem, something that we can do to reclaim reason and rationality and help people value those things. And and frankly, I, you know, I, someone said to me, well, you know, I don't want to do this. I can't stand it. Well, great. Then clean the oceans, right? Then plant a tree or something. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that this is the only right. way to <laughs> contribute to humanity, but that often you'll find that faith is one of the root problems. Oh, we don't yeah. have to worry about global warming in case the fundamental oh. Jesus is coming back. Or we don't have to worry about this. You know, acts, or we, you know, Governor Perry praying for rain. Now, can you imagine that? The governor of the, no. the second most popular state praying for rain? Not only is that a national embarrassment. As, as a Texan, no, I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> are you, so you guys in Texas? I'm in Texas. Yes, well, I'm from Texas. She's she's near she's near you. I'm I'm in Texas. So. Yeah, so I mean, this guy. So I mean, people actually need water, and instead of sitting down and thinking about how we're going to get pe- water to people, you know, and you build a duct or whatever. I mean, I don't have any idea. It's out of my field. I'm not a civil engineer, but but uh, this guy's praying for rain, right? So so that kind of inactivity and false hope, because that's what prayer is. It's a false hope. So, yeah, so by the way, just to, just to interject expensive. here real quick, this has this has nothing. I'm sorry, Dar, but this has nothing to do with this conversation at all. But I do want to point out, by the way, that um, you know Texas um, uses millions of gallons of fresh water every single month um, for fracking, and uh, I know yeah. this because I actually work for a. Um, I actually, I'm an executive in a uh, in in uh, in a corporation that has. Um, you know, oil and gas ties, and that actually has a company that is, you know, a an oil and gas company, and millions of gallons of water actually go to this every, literally every single month, and um, nobody bats an eyelash. Eyelash. So, you know, it's kind of funny that Rick Perry would pray for rain instead of just telling these guys to stop using the fresh water and bring in salt water. But oh you yeah, know, that, anyway, that might be a good thing. Yeah, I just want to say something really quick before we get totally um, off the subject about you said, you know, how no, 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 you might fail or you feel like you fail. And and um, I I think this is another thing that I agreed with you in, in your book. And it's important that people, I think, not set their expectations to why. I, you actually don't know if you failed entirely, right? You, you say that a couple times, but like, I don't know. I, yeah. Something might have happened later. You can get through to somebody and don't realize it. Don't set some strange, I don't know of anybody who gets to the end of one conversation with, with a, 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 a believer and the believer has just abandoned every last belief and feels totally comfortable with it and shakes your hand and leaves. So, um, you know, if I can get somebody to think about it or acknowledge a couple points and then I just sort of, sure. you know, back off and try not to, you know, crowd them too much at that point, I choose to see that as a success. <laughs> a yeah, and, and imagine <laughs> if if enough people, if we got enough people to use these techniques and help them, if the next day they got somebody else and they encountered them yeah. and, and it really got them thinking in a different way. I think the mistake that people make, and I think someone asked me about this on a podcast, aren't you afraid you'll make them worse? Actually, really? Come on. Uh, worse. They believe in a talking snake and people rise in tombs or Joseph Smith and the book Respectable. I mean, they believe all this stuff and you're going to make them worse? Like what? what after a conversation with you, then they're going to believe that, you know, radishes can fly? I mean, but what worse? What, what does that even mean that, that you make it? No. You're not, going to, you're not going to increase the number of propositions of belief. You're not going to pollute their epistemic structure with more silliness. They've got enough silliness. Right. So, so your conversation with them cannot worsen their epistemic situation. It can only ameliorate the suffering. Yeah. And that's so the dovetail what we spoke about before, why you shouldn't ridicule people in these one-on-one engagements because you've harmed them, because then they right. dig deeper into these delusions they already have. So you, not only you mentioned doxastic openness, willingness or just uh, uh, changing one's mind about something, not only do they not do that, 
but then they they hunker down. So you 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 have worsened their situation. Further entrenched. So, yeah. Yeah. And then I got to take my daughter right, to um, dinner pretty soon, so I got to go. Okay, uh, Jared, sorry. Jared, All right. Uh, you so no, no, it's fine. So we have we have about five minutes left. Um, Peter, real quick, there was one question that that I had for you tonight that that I thought was really important. We did a whole episode on the historicity of Jesus, and we explained why um, David Fitzgerald and Richard Carrier were wrong and why the majority of historians disagreed with their position. Do you accept the historical consensus that Jesus was a real dude? Well, you know, I've read Price. I know Carrier. Um, I've I've uh, read Barn Ehrman, obviously, and I, I, I don't think it's important. No, I, I don't, don't think it makes yeah. one I, iota I, of difference. In, in all in all fairness, in all fairness, I didn't ask you whether or not it was important. I asked whether or not you agreed with historical consensus. Oh, I'm not trying to be a I dick. I mean, no, this no, is no, an no, important I, thing. I, I don't. I mean. Yeah, no, I don't. I just think people get lost. It's kind of like the problem of evil. I think people get lost in those questions, and then the question becomes something other than what we should not we, you and I, but what, other than what one should be talking sure, but, about. Sure, but you can't. Sure, but you can't be an academic. You can't be an academic in one hand, and then in the same dismiss academic consensus based on tangible demonstrable evidence. I mean, yeah, it's so a little I'll bit contradictory, you, I'll, don't you think? I'll, I'll give you my opinion, and uh, I'm I'm offering this as a definitive true explanation. I don't know. Uh, sure. <laughs> I don't know. There seems to be a consensus among scholars that there was a historical Jesus. Um, I heard something yes. interesting many years ago on NPR in which, but again, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, scholar of uh, history, so I'm really the worst person to ask on that. I heard something about whether or not the, the if it, Jesus was not an historical figure, if that would damage people's faith. And I just thought, like, wow. Many no, I, I don't think so what, at all. I, I think what, all three of us agree that would have no bearing on it. Yeah, so none of it. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, the fundamentalists it might have a bearing on, but – yeah. So I don't know the, the uh, direct answer to your question. I I don't know if I if you push me into a corner and said, well, you have to take a stance, yes or no, is Jesus an historical figure? Yeah, he was. I'm with Bart Ehrman that there's a difference between historical claims and theological claims. And he oh, completely about, different. Yeah, he yeah. The historical about that contention. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, we lived with crucified. Right, that was it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Talk about the existence of a dude named Jesus, not even his miracle claims. There were a couple parts in your book where. I kind of sort of got the impression that you might, you know, view it, you know, like Richard Carrier and some of these other people who are in like this very super duper small percentage of historians similar to creationists on the side of, of biology. So, so yeah, it's not, know, it's not relevant to the topic. To it was just something that we just talked about, so that's why. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. I don't, yeah, I, my, my, uh, my answer is I really, I really don't know. I mean, you're, you're truly asking, it would be like asking me about fracking and water in Texas. I don't have an <laughs> idea. I don't know. Really <laughs> well, Peter, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming out and talking to us. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed your book. And, we, yeah, and indeed. I've I learned a lot from the lot. conversation, for sure. Oh, cool. Well, well, thanks. I, I appreciate you having me on. It's a very kind of you to uh, to invite me and uh, take some of your time to, to talk with me. And thanks for what you're doing. You know, we're all we're all trying to undo some of the damage that the faith virus has caused. And so I yeah. appreciate the contributions that you guys are making to make our community more sane and more rational. So thanks. All right. Well, I look forward right. to that. All right, Peter Bogosian, a manual for creating atheists. Pick it up at Amazon. And Peter, we really do appreciate you coming on. My pleasure. You guys have a great night. All right. All right. Thanks. You too. Yes, sir. Take you care. too. Yep. Take care. All right. You there? We have sixty seconds. Yeah, no, 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 we Why have not? 60 seconds. So you've been listening to LogiCast. We are on every Thursday, 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. Next Thursday, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. No clue. Nope, but we will always tell you in advance, so make sure that you check out our Facebook page. And it, might be, it, might be, it, it might be four days. It might be one day. <laughs> but you will know. It. <laughs> so, all right. Good night, Darby. Good night.
either man-made. They both want to question authority and demand slave. And any incarnation of slavery is not good. So from here we can deduce I call syndrome is not hood. But it gets deeper than this, especially when people get pissed. When you point out their deity's nature and even intent. But I'll never worship anything with evil in it. Especially something who allows evil to even exist. I don't give a shit if he created me. I don't give him the right to commit genocide with pride and act crazily. His abuse and neglect and claim is crooked biz. If it's from Cali, DCFS, but it came and took his kids. Belief is so important that if you don't, you go to hell. Without the type of proof you need in court to avoid a jail. Give me the gas can and send me. I don't need the draws all because I can't fathom how your God does. I don't need to call on you, but this looks like in prison. Then. Yeah, the worst is that the prisoners don't know that they're prisoners. Yeah. Even defend the tactics that they used to imprison them. You're a cocker mind, trying to yeah. cocker brother mind, spelling out here on the but this looks like in prison, man. Yeah. The worst is that the prisoners don't know that the prisoners One, even two. defend the tactics that they used to imprison them. Another conquered mind, trying to conquer other minds. Later on, and there are true religious freedom is an oxymoron. None of them books scare me, not the Bible, not the Koran. This is the Islam, and it's fundamentalism. The day you release your women, I'll quit releasing venom. Until then, no amount of scientific contributions could ever excuse your hateful chauvinistic institution. But here's the real reason I'm not a Muslim. Children, the you're anointed prophet, you the fuck up. Listen, Muhammad was taking children as wives. One he married at six and consummated at nine. He was somewhere in his fifties trying to get in and draw. She wasn't even ten yet, still playing with dogs. So they try to hit me with the oh, the times were different. Rationalizing atrocities, now you sound like Christians. I charge the views on women and sickening. Either update the culture or just fade into history. But either way, this looks like in prison, man. What's worse is that the prisoners don't know that they're prisoners. Even defend the tactics that they used to imprison them. A conquered mind, trying to yeah. conquer other minds. Selling out here on the But this looks like in prison, man. What's worse is that the prisoners don't know that they're prisoners. Even defend the tactics that they used to imprison them. A conquered mind, trying to conquer other minds. A challenge out here on the But this looks like in prison, man. What's worse is that the prisoners don't know that they're prisoners. Even defend the tactics that they used to imprison them. A conquered mind, trying to yeah. conquer other minds. Selling out here on the But this looks like in prison, man. What's worse is that the prisoners don't know that they're prisoners. Even defend the tactics that they used to imprison them. A conquered mind, trying to conquer other minds. A challenge out here on the truth. about women in Islam. Now I am free, but I cannot forget my niece. She was forced to marry her cousin when she was 10. He was over 40. Her marriage was valid and legalized under the Islamic Sharia because Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, married his second wife when she was six. He was over 15. Over 15.